This is Rejected Knowledge. And this is part one of Lords of the Press by George Seldes. Good luck finding this one. Uh, it's way out of print. From 1938. You might be able to find a, a few used copies on Amazon.com that haven't been burned up in the memory hole. You won't find this at your local library in extreme likelihood. I had to search, uh, do a interlibrary loan search throughout all the library libraries in my county, and I found one. There was one library that had had an old copy, and I placeholded it. I ordered it, and waited a few days, and they let me know they couldn't find it. So it, it was on their records that they had one copy in the whole county. But it was missing. In other words, it was memory hold. So I went to the next county over, did an interlibrary loan search there. Again, there was one copy in some in one in one library in the county. I did a a place hold again, and this time it turned up and it it came back. And I I'm holding it. This is easily the most beaten up, worn book that I have ever checked out of a library. I'm shocked that they didn't, I am shocked that they didn't throw it away. It's all taped up here. All the pages are yellow. Usually people don't appreciate this stuff, and they memory hole it. Well, here it is, again. Lords of the Press by George Seldes from 1938. Obviously there's, apparently at least, there's there's something in here that we're not supposed to know about. What is it? Let's find out. Chapter 1. The House of Lords Once every year, the American Newspaper Publishers Association, the House of Lords of our press, meets in secret. No one cares to spy on it. No newspapermen are present. No photographers interrupt. No representatives of a yellow journal harass or intimidate the members. It would be useless. If a reporter found out what plans are discussed, what plots are made, what schemes are proposed, no newspaper would publish the disclosures, sensational as they might be. Nothing is sacred to the American press but itself. And yet these secret meetings of our organized publishers rank among the most important actions against the general welfare of the American people, ever taken legally by any small national group in our time. But since the press publishes the news, true or false or halfway, about everything in the world except itself, the American public knows nothing about what the rulers of public opinion annually decide for it. Only rarely do the millions learn or sense the truth about the activities of this group of leaders. In the repudiation of the press in the 1936 election, there was a symptom of the universal suspicion and growing anger of the public. But this awakening was made possible by the fact that millions were already pledged to the party the majority of newspapers attacked and the radio was used extensively, and there were other means of breaking the press offensive. In social rather than political issues, there is no means by which the public can defeat the dictation of the press. The publishers' meetings are secret because their actions cannot bear the light of publicity. Three hundred and sixty days in the year the publishers speak editorially for open covenants openly arrived at, whether in international relations or in the advertising business, but every April they lock the doors and make a hypocritical paradox out of their own ideals. We know that in the open meetings they approve annually of Quote, freedom of the press as the bulwark of our civilization, unquote. 
and that in the closed meetings they discuss ways and means of fighting labor and their own employees who demand higher wages, or perhaps better light or decent toilet arrangements. We do know that in the open meetings they pledge themselves to honesty and truth, and the whole bag full of tricks in the ethical code of their profession. And they also discuss the cost of paper, the ways to increase advertising and gain circulation, and other purely materialistic subjects which are necessary if any press, free or kept, is to survive. But it is somewhat of a shock to learn that, in the closed sessions, they defend the employment of child labor, they take united action against a congressional measure which would keep drug makers from poisoning or cheating the American people, and they gloat over their own strike-breaking department, which offers scabs not only to members but to anyone who wants to fight the unions. One of the most recent secret meetings was devoted to nothing but war on the American Newspaper Guild, the association of newspaper workers which offended the publishers when it joined the American Federation of Labor and drove them into hysterics when it later joined the Committee for Industrial Organization. In all American business and industry today, there is probably no instance of such bitterness, such conflict, such hatred, such opposition, and such war to the throat as between the newspaper workers and the newspaper owners. The amusing angle to this story is that the publishers still print that cockeyed falsehood about the interests of capital and labor being identical. It certainly isn't in their own line. What conspiratorial plans are made to fight labor at the secret sessions, we can judge best by what happens. We have seen such united action as an attack on Congress when it considered passing the Wagner Labor Act, which is regarded as a Magna Carta of the working people of America. We have watched the press of the country condemn it after it passed. And, moreover, we have seen the publishers openly defy the law, declare it unconstitutional, and, when the Guild took the test case to the Supreme Court and the law was declared constitutional, we have seen the publishers inaugurate a movement to repeal or alter or emasculate this law. We have seen the publishers declare the National Labor Relations Board unconstitutional long before the Supreme Court declared it constitutional. We have seen the publishers unite to fight any and every attempt to increase taxes on the rich and alleviate the burdens of the poor. All sorts of transcendental humanitarian poppycock has been invented by the highly paid editorial writers and rich columnists to hide this fundamental conflict of the haves and have-nots in America. But the fact is becoming known to the public that the press lords of America are the champions of the former while still flying the pre-war flag of, quote, service to the common people, unquote. There are, of course, many men of the highest ideals in the membership. But so far as can be learned, they have not been able in the past to gain their points even in the most flagrant cases of violation of journalistic ethics. The La Follette Civil Liberties Investigation Committee has given documentary evidence that four of the biggest newspapers in the country had employed spies or thugs, 
but no action was taken by the Publishers Association. Some years ago, one of its members was found guilty in a federal court of theft. His news service had stolen the news from another service, but he was not fired from either the Publishers Association or the service which he robbed and of which he is still a member. Another newspaper was found guilty of blackmailing oil companies for a million dollars, and a third of suppressing the scandal for ninety-two thousand dollars. There was some talk of taking action. Twenty or more of the big newspapers of the country were found by a congressional investigation to be secretly controlled by the Power and Paper Trust. Colonel Robert Ewing, publisher of the New Orleans States, president of the Southern Newspaper Publisher Association, a component branch of the ANPA, offered, at the convention of the latter, a resolution condemning the Power and Paper Trust's activities. It was tabled. S. E. Thomason. Then of the Chicago Journal, went Colonel Ewing one better, with a resolution that all the great publishers in America make public all their connections with power and paper trusts, with all the banks, and with all the powerful financial institutions which control the country. The resolution was defeated with a roar of laughter. On the other hand, when a speaker for the National Electric Light Association, with its twenty-five million dollar a year fund for influencing newspapers, said at its convention that quote, "There we are, brothers under the skin, utility and newspaper battling shoulder to shoulder. Our most important contact is." The American Newspaper Publishers Association. Unquote. The latter accepted the remark as a compliment. In fact, every annual convention proves more fully than the last the statement made by William Allen White, now president of the Editors Association, that the newspaper business is a business and nothing more. The code of ethics of the journalistic profession is no longer put into practice, but all the anti-social activities of big business have become the program of the ANPA. In fact, it is frequently difficult to distinguish its program from that of the National Association of Manufacturers. And the United States Chamber of Commerce, Haywood Brune, president of the guild, who attended several open and secret sessions one year, said he was shocked by the smallness quote, of this collection of very small men, so obviously drunk with a smug sense of power and self-righteousness, who get themselves up. As the full and all-sufficient judges of what the public should get in the way of news and of opinion,、unquote. he listened for days.、Quote. The ghost of Thomas Jefferson was sent whirling along the flying trapeze, as Bainbridge Colby, exhumed from heaven knows where, uttered dreary Tory platitudes about big business and its sacred rights. I was struck by the fact that, with the mild exception of Glenn Frank, all the spokesmen and invited orators of the publishers were old men, and they did not talk of journalism but of the industry. If a man from Mars had happened in, I think he might have spent an hour and still remained puzzled as to whether he had happened in. Upon a convention of bankers, cotton mill owners, or the makers of bathroom supplies.
the publishers decided that they would accept no sort of code of fair practice whatsoever. They decided not to disturb carrier boys between the ages of ten and twelve who were already on the job. They condemned the mild Copeland bill on food and drugs. H. W. Flagg of the Philadelphia Public Ledger, chairman of the Open Shop Committee, unofficially offered the services of his committee to all publishers, members and non-members, for strike-breaking purposes. And so you see once more the publishers have saved the freedom of the press, unquote. When the National Electric Light Association was engaged in buying the goodwill of the American press, it also maintained a lobby in Washington for the purpose of using congressmen for its own commercial purposes. This lobby was never exposed or mentioned. Other lobbies, notably those which are not in any way affiliated with advertising, have from time to time been the subject of newspaper attacks. They have given the word lobby a sinister connotation, associated with such words as propaganda and isms and other things called un-American. But for years there has been a powerful lobby at work in Washington, which, up to now, has been more successful than any, except possibly the American Legion lobby. This is the publisher's lobby. It is not only active in making laws, amending laws, and preventing laws, but it has the unique distinction, can it be because of the power of the press, of recommending that the publishers break the law. Incidents and illustrations of this group's power are many and important. But before sampling those of New Deal time, I would like to mention an exposure of this lobby, which can be found in 62nd Congress, First Session, Senate Documents, Volume 6, Reciprocity with Canada Hearings, Volume 2. Because this episode although belonging to another generation, nevertheless illuminates not only the means the organization still employs, but also furnishes a clue to subjects of later chapters. The United States, as many readers may remember, has from time to time been the scene of hefty debate over tariffs on foreign goods. The Republican press has been in favor, the democratic press has been opposed to them. The industrialist North generally for protection, the agricultural South for free trade, the Republican newspaper propaganda insisting that prosperity and the full dinner pail, what memories these old-fashioned words bring up, depended entirely upon the tariff wall keeping cheap foreign goods out and the American laborer contented in rich green pastures, the Democrat denying it all at every depression. At the very time the Republican newspapers were publishing this drivel and propaganda, they combined with the owners of Democratic newspapers in lobbying in Washington for the purpose of getting print paper and wood pulp exempt from a proposed severe tariff bill. The matter involved was a mere five million dollars per annum for the entire newspaper industry, no awe-inspiring sum in the face of a yearly advertising budget of one and a half to two billions, and the fact that more than one newspaper had net annual earnings of five millions or more. Yet for this sum, at least half the entire press of the United States was willing to give up 
its editorial policies regarding tariff, and join with its political enemies in a non-partisan bit of lobbying. Among those who called on the Secretary of State to demand free wood pulp and free print paper was Frank B. Noyes of the Washington Star, one of the founders of the Associated Press, and its president up till April 1938. Within a few days after this visit, the president of the ANPA, Herman Ritter, sent a letter to every publisher member or not, which, after mentioning a saving of five millions, added that the bill, if ratified, would also save our forests and remove, quote, a tax upon knowledge, unquote. Therefore, quote, will you promptly communicate with your senators and representatives in Congress and urge favorable action, unquote. So far, the activities of the publisher's lobby had been both legal and ethical, but apparently the matter was not going through unopposed, for in the congressional investigation there was introduced a copy of a confidential telegram which Ritter also sent, saying that, quote, it is of vital importance to the newspapers that their Washington correspondents be instructed to treat favorably the Canadian Reciprocity Agreement, unquote. This request was a violation of every code of ethics in the history of journalism. During the course of the debate, it was proved that the quote-unquote tax upon knowledge was pure hypocrisy. It was purely a savings for publishers. The claim the reader would be benefited financially was proven false. It would take about 33 years for one average copy of a daily to consume a ton, and the duty of $3.75 meant 10 cents a year more for each subscriber. And when farmers spoke against the tariff cut, the Associated Press men took no notes, whereas those who spoke for it made the headlines. When Melville Stone, head of the AP, said the press was fair, although 90% of the publishers were against the tariff, it was proven statistically that the AP itself was sending out six times as much pro as anti-news and Mr. Stone was forced to admit that it was due, quote, either to stupidity on the part of the people who were reporting, or ordinary weaknesses that attach to human beings, unquote. These human weaknesses eventually rob a nation of a free press, as great editors will testify. They are the weaknesses of egotism, of power-seeking, of greed for profits, which men in other businesses often admit, but which most publishers hide under beautiful words about public service. However, in the actions of the publisher's lobby against all reform legislation in more recent times, we can see these motives a little more clearly than in the hypocritical past. From the earliest days of the so-called New Deal, and immediately following the 1933 pro-Roosevelt parade, in which the publishers marched under a friendly banner, their lobby has aimed at getting the press exempt from every law and regulation which affects other businesses and which might also affect their profits. The story is told that Bernard Shaw, leaving an Albert Hall meeting which he had addressed, was stopped by a beggar who held out a tin can. Press, said Mr. Shaw, and moved on. Apocryphal, as this story may be, it illustrates well the attitude of the American newspaper publishers. In reply to every attempt to apply legislation affecting 
unionization, child labor, hours, wages, sanitation, working conditions, or other social reforms upon them, they have excused themselves with Mr. Shaw's remark. They have not only whispered but bellowed, Freedom of the press! The President put them in their place in 1934, when the industrial codes, later outlawed, were hailed as the salvation of the nation. The publisher's lobby favored a code for every business except theirs. But since this could not be, they drew one up which was, quote, the most dishonest, weasel-worded, and treacherous document, unquote, ever offered to General Johnson. The publisher's lobby code was so designed that it would permit them to escape all the obligations for promoting prosperity, which they were urging upon all the rest of the nation. When General Johnson threw the lobby code aside, the lobby replied by publishing a false statement that it had been accepted. When this intimidation failed, the lobby demanded that Postmaster General Farley put pressure upon Johnson. When this also failed, the attack was continued with other weapons, one tabloid going so far as to publish an untrue story about the general and his party crashing a speakeasy. General Johnson went speaking throughout the country. He was bitter against the publishers, and especially the lobby. He declared, quote, They are few in number, but ruthless in method. Some of them control powerful newspapers, and they are using these papers to misrepresent every development of NRA. It is no longer possible to get a square deal in truth and accuracy, unquote. But the betting in newspaper offices was ten to one that, quote, the big steamroller, as represented by the American Newspaper Publishers Association, would crush General Johnson, the president himself, and everyone connected with the NRA, unquote. This steamroller is still crushing. In several instances, it is sad but true, the president has given in to the publishers, and the latter repaid him by joining, Democrats and Independents with Republicans, in the vast 1936 campaign against his second election. In 1935, the publishers' lobby won four of its five campaigns in Washington and barely lost the last, an exemption from the provision of the Wagner Labor Disputes Bill, where the newspaper guild was on the side of labor as opposed to the publishers who represented the employers. During the Senate hearings, Elisha Hansen, attorney for the ANPA, attacked the bill as a whole on the ground that it would infringe freedom to print or fail to print what the publishers wished. In the House, the publishers got Representative William P. Connery, Democrat, Massachusetts, to add a proviso, which was nothing more than the old freedom of the press clause always trotted out when profits are at stake. The Guild spokesman, however, exposed this maneuver, and the amendment was out when the bill passed. It is now well known that the publishers played the strongest hand in defeating the Tugwell Bill. Nevertheless, when the first Copeland Bill, its mild, emasculated successor, was produced in Congress, the publishers joined the Proprietary Association of Drug Manufacturers in defeating it also. The reason for this sanguinary attack on a bill already weakened to please the drug makers, wow, the pharmaceuticals ruled even then, and they were poisoning people even then, 
was the publisher's insistence on clauses putting all the blame for violations on the manufacturers and dealers, none on the advertising agencies and newspapers. <laughs> along came the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and along came the publishers with amendments, one definitely stating that no marketing order could be issued, quote, prohibiting, regulating, or restricting, unquote, advertising, and providing that no processing tax can be fixed on material to be made into wood pulp from which newsprint is manufactured. The black 30-hour week bill was kept in Representative Connery's Labor Committee until it emerged with exemptions for banks, newspapers, and magazines. Finally, there was the Eastman Bus and Truck Bill, which was sent to the President for signature. It gives the Interstate Commerce Commission power to regulate motor carriers, but makes four commodity exceptions the first being livestock, fish, and agricultural products, the last being newspapers. When this list of 1935 achievements of the publisher's pressure lobby was announced, the Guild reporter said it was, quote, overcome with admiration, unquote. Of course, that provision in the last of the laws, which sets maximum hours for truck drivers hauling papers in interstate commerce, might well be interpreted as an attack on freedom of the press. Naturally, any attempt by Congress to tax wood pulp is a violation of the Constitution, which grants liberty to publishers. And, of course, if Congress insisted that the advertisers of worthless drugs tell the same truth drugs are worse than worthless today george seldes they're poison tell the same truth in the newspapers which the 1906 law requires them to tell on the labels that would curtail sales curtail advertising curtail profits for publishers and therefore become the most dastardly attack on the american public's inherent right to a free press, which our history has ever known. So you see, the lobby has a lot of work. Oh boy, my wife and I got a few chickens a couple of months ago, and a couple of them turned out to be roosters when they have almost grown up, and you can hear one out the door now. i got to get rid of those two. <laughs> oh man. What, do I, what, what was I telling you folks? This is a one-horse operation. <laughs> okay, you're just going to be hearing uh, adolescent roosters in the background. I'm sorry. Continuing. It may not be ethical or decent or moral in the higher sense, but it is generally legal. The great publishers of America have never been afraid to defy legality when it was to their own benefit to do so. Openly, the House of Lords has always stood for law and order, so far as others were concerned. Generally speaking, the big press of the nation has always accused labor of favoring and originating violence throughout the long and bloody history of the struggle of the working people for a better life. The exact opposite is true. After the daily newspaper has screamed its charge against the unions, the impartial historian has found, too late to be of any practical use, that in some ninety cases out of a hundred, it is the employer or the police or the enemies of labor who are guilty of favoring and initiating violence. And when it comes to law-breaking or defiance of the law, actions which are generally charged only to criminals, the publishers have a great advantage when they do so because there can be no public outcry against them, no protest, no vox populi, no wave of indignation, nor any of the other movements they frequently invent, 
knowing they themselves are the only channel for such movements. Here are, for example, two forces which affect the newspapers and their profits. Despite publishers' opposition, the Wagner Act was passed. The National Labor's Relations Board came into being. Manufacturers did not like it, but they obeyed it. Not so the publishers. If, said Elisha Hansen, chief counsel for the ANPA, the NLRB issues an order in this case, Mr. Hurst will not comply with it. In October 1936, this same Hansen sent out a general statement to the publishers, telling them not to obey the rulings of the same board, because he, Hansen, thought they were unconstitutional. He ordered, quote, Publishers from now on should flatly refuse to have anything to do with the National Labor Relations Board other than to notify it it is without power under the Constitution to interfere with their business. In so far as the newspaper business is concerned, I am convinced no order of the board directed to a publisher requiring him to comply with a decision thereof will, if it is contested, be upheld in the courts, unquote. The order under discussion, the Watson case, was upheld. The NLRB law was upheld. In other lines of business, the government and its laws have also been challenged, but not defied. Government laws and regulations have been obeyed pending the institution of suits to test constitutionality, but in no important instance has there been defiance as in the case of the publishers. Replying to Hansen's orders to the publishers, the Guild reporter called the lawyer an anarchist. Of his opinion, it said, on October 15, 1936, quote, All concern for the general welfare, all respect for the right of Congress to establish public policies which it deems to be essential for the country, have been abandoned in this document which its board sponsors. A law that most of the millions of workers of the country believe is needed to protect them in their right to earn a decent livelihood, treads to some extent on the interests of 1,200 publishers. Out with it! Ignore it! Unquote. From the very first days of the New Deal, under which, incidentally, newspaper workers were first enabled to organize, until the present, the American Newspaper Guild has charged the publishers with violating not only the spirit of the law, but the laws themselves. The publisher's proposed code was, quote, treacherous and dishonest, unquote, but legal. But the subsequent, quote, unquote, dark maneuverings, said the Guild editorially, proved that, quote, the ANPA undertakes to set itself above Congress and the President, unquote. The Guild, quote, questioned the sincerity of the publishers in their sanctimonious espousal of the freedom of the press. The American Newspaper Guild has been the only organization in the country with the courage to bring the lawless spirit of this self-appointed oligarchy out into the open and denounce it. A truly free and honest press is of more importance to the members of the American Newspaper Guild than any immediate economic interest, unquote. <laughs> Looks like this whole book is going to be attacking. Yeah, I mean, look at the title, How Lords of the Press. It's going to be attacking publishers. <laughs> and you wonder why this book's out of print. <laughs> Oh, that's an easy one to spot. Only one brave publisher agreed with the Guild, J. David Stern of the New York Post, Philadelphia Record, Camden Courier, and Camden Post, 
withdrew his membership in the House of Lords. He wrote the ANPA, quote, We are resigning because your association, founded to benefit and strengthen the daily newspapers of this country, has in the past few years so conducted itself as to lower American newspapers in popular esteem, to endanger the freedom of the press, and has even gone so far as to urge its members to breach the law. I do not see how a law-abiding newspaper can consistently retain membership. Your board recommended to its membership that no agreement be entered into with any group of employees. As we understand the Wagner Act, it is obligatory upon employers to negotiate with representatives of a majority of employees. Ever since the NRA Code, the ANPA has been using the pretext of protecting the freedom of the press to gain special privilege in purely business obligations. That is why I say you are endangering the freedom of the press and one of the most important essentials of democracy. Unquote. Mr. Stern's Philadelphia record quit the ANPA. His New York Post had never been a member. Within a year from that date, no less than twenty-nine charges of violation of the Wagner Act and other laws which not only the Supreme Court but even the Publishers Association admit are legal were made against as many publishers. There were seventeen instances of intimidation, coercion, and actual discharge of employees for utilizing the clauses in the Wagner Act which permit unionization. In six instances, the publishers were accused of breaking the law by refusing to bargain with their employees. In two instances, the publishers were accused of forming company unions. All these episodes forming a record which the official organ of the newspaper writers called, quote, irresponsible, unscrupulous, and contemptible, unquote. Among the newspapers against which charges were filed were Gannett's Knickerbocker Press and Albany News, Boston Herald, Boston Traveler, McCormick's Chicago Tribune, Detroit Times, Hearst's Los Angeles Examiner, the Associated Press in New York, Hearst's New York Daily Mirror, Seattle Post-Intelligencer, Seattle Star. With the exception of only a handful of liberal newspapers, the press of the country, which first failed to get a clause exempting itself from the Wagner Act, then defied the law later in many instances violated the law, is today producing bitter and unfair editorials demanding that this measure, and in fact all measures which favor labor rather than capital, should be repealed. Accused in numerous cases of discharging men for no reason but legal union activity, Many publishers have sought to hide their prejudices by posting a quote-unquote firing code sent them by the ANPA and consisting of sixteen quote-unquote grounds for discharge, one of which is the failure to return a book to its proper place in the bookshelf before going home or leaving the electric bulb turned on over one's desk while going to the toilet, or scratching the furniture. The leader in the anti-labor movement of the ANPA has been its president, James G. Stallman, publisher of the Nashville Banner. He is one of the minor press lords of America, 
and the story of his battle with the unions, his red-baiting, the sensationalizing of anti-CIO news in his paper, and the suppression of news favoring labor will be found in a later chapter. The man chosen to lead the great publishers of America in their oft-denounced fight for the freedom of the press is the same James G. Stallman who, addressing the members of the Bell Mead Country Club, recently said, quote, If I had my way, I would get me six husky policemen, take these labor organizers outside the city limits, and tell them it wouldn't be healthy for them to be seen in the vicinity again. Unquote. The foregoing are some of the subjects which the men who do a large part of the thinking, the leading or the misleading of the nation, discuss in their secret meetings. In the open meetings it is, of course, the welfare of the public, the freedom of the press, with only an occasional word about advertising money. Strike-breaking, the suppression of the labor movement, the maintenance of child labor, the mistakes of its council which sought to destroy the NLRB in the Watson case, and all general topics which are not concerned with public welfare, but with that of the pocketbook, make up most of the four days of the secret meetings which occur every year, and the special Chicago meeting, which was devoted to nothing but an attempt to destroy the newspaper guild. At that time, an anonymous reporter wrote the, quote, March of the Publishers, unquote. And here's the poem. On to Chicago to fight for our freedom. Freedom to hire men, work em and bleed em. Freedom to chisel to heart's content. Freedom to make thirty-seven per cent. On to Chicago, but don't fail to stress that our battle, of course, is for freedom of the press. In the following chapters, some of the individuals, all but one or two little known to the people of the country whose minds they rule, will be discussed at some length, and the common denominator of their power and their motives suggested. The reader may then judge whether or not the most powerful anonymous group of men in America can be classified as the friends or enemies of the American people. It is the writer's intention to let the facts speak for themselves, as Euripides suggested. And if there is criticism, expressed or implied, the reader will please remember that nothing that will be said can equal in severity that which has already come from within the ranks of the profession from the very small minority, it is true, who still upholds the traditional journalistic liberalism of America. It is William Allen White, now president of the National Editorial Association, who first pointed out that the newspapers have degenerated from a noble profession to an eight percent investment and who now states they are dominated by the, quote, unconscious arrogance of conscious wealth, unquote. And it is J. Roscoe Drummond, executive editor of the Christian Science Monitor, who writes that freedom of the press, quote, is not an end in itself. A free press in the United States is not, I believe, in danger from without, it is always in danger from within. A truly free press requires free men to give it life. Free men require free minds, minds intellectually honest, intellectually open, and intellectually eager. The press of the United States needs a leadership dedicated 
to the service of democracy, unquote. The press lords of the United States in one year made this great record. One, fought all issues where their profits were involved. Two, led the attack against a real pure food and drug law. Three, opposed the Wagner Act, the Magna Carta of Labor. Four, urged amendment of proposed social insurance legislation, putting newspapers in a special class. Five, proposed compulsory arbitration of labor disputes with the outlawing of strikes. Six, favored child labor. Seven, frowned at the Securities Act. In its 1935 report, which urged members to fight food, drug, and cosmetic bills, the Wagner-Connery Law, the 30-hour bill, social insurance, and laws, quote, affecting the newspaper business, unquote, ANPA publishers were told to, quote, be constantly alert and vigilant if their properties are not to be destroyed or irreparably injured, unquote. Property, not public welfare, is the program of the ANPA. Their interests, says Alfred McLee, historian of our present journalism, differ little from that of other industries. The ANPA, quote, has sometimes been a powerful adjunct in legislative circles to the lobbies of the United States Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the trade associations of specific industries, unquote. The press needs free men with free minds intellectually open, but its leadership consists of moral slaves whose minds are paralyzed by the specter of profits. The publishers are not leading the American people forward. They are not facing the social issues. Whether more often they are falsifying the social issues, the reader may perhaps judge from the following documentation. And that concludes Chapter 1 of Lords of the Press by... George Seldes from 1938. We're going to take a break before we come back for Chapter 2. Okay, we're back. My uh, my studio's changed. I'm out in my car again. So the, the quality's going to be a little more inferior. I was in the, in the house then, but I, I can't record in the house right now. Uh, look, folks, I, I hope you'll excuse that. Um, I'm just I'm trying to get the information to you. So, uh, sometimes if it's at the the expense of quality, uh, quality of, of, of sound, understand the quality of the information is nowadays the, peerless. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to hear this any anywhere else. So, if you know if you can, you know, I, there's cars going by in the background, but I, I got to be out my car. I'm I'm at work on my break. Uh, so. Without further ado, never mind all that what I just said. It's uh, chapter two now. In this one horse operation, rejected knowledge. Uh, chapter two of Lords of the Press by George Seldes from 1938. Chapter two is entitled Patterson, Lord of Tabloidia. Quote, Mr. Patterson is a young man who has lately surprised his wealthy friends in Chicago, by coming out publicly as a socialist. He here explains his position, unquote. So read the editorial note at the head of the article Confessions of a Drone, which Joseph Medill Patterson, a member of what was then known as the Idle Rich Class, wrote for the August 30th, 1906 issue of The Independent. It made a great sensation. It is as interesting an apologia, pro sua vita, 
as our generation has produced, and it serves also to explain the numerous seeming paradoxes and exasperating discrepancies which America's first and now most important tabloid newspaper presents. How great a sensation this rich man caused by becoming a socialist and renouncing the financial and journalistic system into which he was born can be judged from the numerous versions of his confessions, which were reprinted throughout a decade and distributed by the tens of thousands, and the comment in the press of the time, when Corliss, the son of Thomas W. Lamont, partner of J.P. Morgan, espoused the cause of Soviet Russia two decades later, there was comparative silence. The world was becoming accustomed to sons of wealth defending the enemies of wealth. Quote, I am talking about myself, the type of the idle, rich young man, not myself the individual. I have an income of between ten and twenty thousand dollars a year. I spend all of it. I produce nothing, am doing no work. I can keep on doing this all my life unless the present social system is changed." Unquote. So Patterson begins his confession. Quote, my income doesn't descend upon me like manna from heaven. It can be traced. Some of it comes from the profits of a daily newspaper. Some of it comes from Chicago real estate. Some from the profits made by the Pennsylvania and other railroads. Some from the profits of the United States Steel Corporation. Some from the profits of the American Tobacco Company." Unquote. Mr. Patterson then judges the Chicago real estate earnings by applying to it the Henry George single tax formula. Quote, the people who came to Chicago to work caused the increase in value, but I get the benefit of it. Unquote. But the profits from the Pennsylvania Railroad, U.S. Steel, and American Tobacco Company, he admits, are paid him not by fellow capitalists, but by the men who work and ride, the makers and users of steel and tobacco. Quote, the men who run the trains are underpaid for the work they do, and those who ship or travel overpay for the service they get. We capitalists get the margin in between. Unquote. And Mr. Patterson continues, quote, For instance, it takes to support me just about twenty times as much as it takes to support an average working man or farmer. And the funny thing about it is that these working men and farmers work hard all year round, while I don't work at all. I have better food, better clothes, and better houses than the workers who supply me with money to spend. I can travel oftener, I have horses to ride and drive, domestic servants, the best physicians. My children will never go to work in a cotton mill or a sweatshop. In short, I lead a far more highly civilized life than the working people. I have offered me the choice of all the best things that man in his stay upon this earth has discovered, evolved, or created. The working people do not have this choice offered them. They are left for them the shoddy things of life. Hard work and small reward. I have little or no work, and the earth's best for reward. The work of the working people, and nothing else, produces the wealth, which, by some hocus-pocus arrangement, is transferred to me, leaving them bare. While they support me in splendid style, what do I do for them? Let the candid upholder of the present order answer, for I am not aware of doing anything for them. 
It is said that I supply a wage fund out of which their wages are paid. Nonsense. If every bond and stock certificate and every real estate abstract were burned today in a huge fire, the vacant titles of ownership falling naturally to the community, trains would pull out on schedule time tomorrow. That my life is so much completer than the lives of the workers who support me has been excused on the ground that they are less cultivated and therefore less fitted to enjoy things which please me. But that seems a little like begging the question. I don't think it was entirely natural aptitude that marked me out for a university education, since I remember that frequently I had to pay money to tutors to drill into my head information of a remarkably simple character. I was fond of a good time, and that I had. Of course it took money, which was obligingly supplied via my family, by the pressmen, the switchmen, the cigarette girls, the rolling mill men, etc., Unquote. When he got out of college, Patterson went to work for the Chicago Tribune. Quote, I started at the bottom, unquote, at fifteen dollars a week, just as his college mates went into their father's Wall Street offices. He adds, quote, but I knew it was play-acting all the time, just as they did. I was not living on a fifteen-dollar-a-week basis, and they were not living on a three-dollar-a-week basis. I wasn't afraid of losing my job. I got an allowance in addition to the fifteen, and the allowance was by considerable the more substantial figure. The allowance came from the pressmen, switchmen, cigarette girls, the other reporters, etc., via my family. It was just this allowance that makes all the difference, unquote. The allowance came from the exploitation of the workers and customers of the corporations, whose stocks and bonds the family held. Mr. Patterson concludes, quote, If a man produces two thousand dollars worth of wealth a year, and consumes ten thousand dollars worth a year, he is overpaid. If he is overpaid, some must be underpaid. Socialism urges the underpaid to unite and insist on receiving the full amount of the wealth they produce. Unquote. This conclusion was not strong enough. In the later reprint for the pocket Library of Socialism, number 45, Patterson adds the following paragraphs, quote, So it is with all capitalists, insofar as they receive interest, profit, and rent, they are economic idlers, taking toll of the labor of others and returning nothing. Insofar as they actively further business, by superintendence or otherwise, they are laborers, worthy in many cases of their hire. The wealth appropriated by capital through the agencies of rent, profit, and interest is obviously appropriated from the working people, the creators of all wealth. Therefore, it is to the working people that socialism addresses itself urging them to veto their own further exploitation." Unquote. At the time the foregoing confession was written, socialism was still quite a respectable religion. There was little hysterical red-baiting in the press, and one could not really tell the descendant of Joseph Medill to go back to the country he came from if he was dissatisfied with the capitalist system in Chicago. However, young Patterson was attacked in the press, and he retaliated by calling it the capitalist press, 
and showing how stupid it was in answering his arguments. He wrote in what I believe was the fourth and last reprint of his Confessions of a Drone, quote, Since the foregoing appeared in the Independent, many criticisms of it have appeared in the capitalist press. The burden of practically every one of these criticisms has been, if young Patterson feels that way, why doesn't he give away his money to the poor? From which it is fair to surmise that the capitalist press cannot explain what useful economic functions young Patterson and the rest of his class perform. The article was written about the whole capitalist class as explicitly mentioned in the first paragraph. The reason the whole capitalist class doesn't give its money and go to work is because it doesn't want to. It is quite satisfied with its present arrangement of luxury, dominion, and idleness. As long as the working class is satisfied with its present arrangement of poverty, obedience, and laboriousness, the present arrangement will continue. But whenever the working class wants to discontinue the present arrangement, it can do so. It has the great majority. J. M. P. Unquote. Patterson's career as a socialist reached a considerable height with the publication of his novel, A Little Brother of the Rich, two years later. In this book, the rich are snobs, cads, crooks, and generally wicked people, and the poor are heroic and noble. But there is also an understanding of social issues. At the very beginning, one Paul Potter receives a letter from Sylvia Castle of the Middle West saying, It seems to me best for your own sake that you should be free. Paul immediately replies, I love you, dearly beloved, with all my heart and soul and strength and mind, and I will marry you because it is ordained. Well, it was ordained for just a few minutes, because just as he gets ready to start for the mailbox, Paul reads of the failure of the Castle Bank in Indiana. So he agrees to end the engagement. Paul's caddishness is surpassed by that of his pal Carl Wilmerding IV, whose father, the third, purchases for cash a decision from him to give up the woman he loves, lives with, and with whom he has a child he worships. There is one fine scene in which Wilmerding III lays down the ethics of a capitalist gentleman's relationship with women. He says, quote, if a gentleman chooses to indulge himself, he does it like a gentleman. He finds some pretty woman for his left hand, who amuses him for a while, and when he is through, he pays her off and all is done. He doesn't allow children to be born to him, and he doesn't keep the thing up for four years with every apparent intention of keeping it up indefinitely. That is not worthy of you, nor of any other gentleman. It shows low tastes of which I am ashamed. Unquote. Paul Potter does the dirty work of dissolving the Wilmerding the Fourth liaison and gets a market tip netting fifty four thousand dollars, which his silly high society wife immediately spends in order to join the old rich real aristocracy. We are then introduced to high society and to a critic of the era who says of its women, quote, they can't sing, they can't dance, they can't act, they can't paint, they can't sew, they can't cook, they can't educate, they are inept, 
unthorough, inconsequential, rudderless, compassless drifting. They don't know life because they have never lived life. They are like perpetual typhoid fever patients, supported always on rubber water mattresses, helpless, hapless, hopeless, nervous, disappointed, cloyed, and cowardly. They exist a few years here, seeking to have all their living done for them by paid dependents. They delegate all their functions in life, save one, and even that they don't do well or often. Unquote. Wow, that's a scathing indictment. Uh, we meet later the great castle man, the famous American actress, who has triumphed in the plays of Ibsen and other giants of the new century, Gorky, Shaw, Sudermann, and Hauptmann. And we meet in her the emerging modern young American woman. But to Paul Potter she is more, importantly, his old sweetheart, Sylvia Castle. They confess their love, their everlasting love. Soon enough, while the great Castleman is triumphing in London, Mrs. Potter is most fortunately killed off while philandering with a boyfriend in a racing car. And Sylvia, who had but recently offered to live with Paul, now expects that the barrier having been removed, he will come across with the conventional offer of marriage. But he frowns, and then Sylvia realizes that it is social position that stands between them and marriage. After all, Paul Potter is a banker and broker, the very epitome of the social, economic, financial system. He cannot marry an actress, but he can keep her secretly. Whereupon the heroine replies, quote, You say you fear I might interfere with your social position. Social position! Unquote. Her words volleyed forth. What is it you mean but the chance to go to the garish, vulgar houses of sure-thing gamblers? You are a cheap little tout, Potter, whose business in life is to pull in victims for the operators of gigantic confidence games. You live uselessly. The world were better without you. You should be swept away, you and those like you. You add not one yacht of knowledge or wisdom or happiness or wealth or health or virtue to the world, and yet... By the skillful, crooked tricks of your vicious trade, you have filched from it ease, emolument, respect, luxury, and power. To whom does society owe position? To you, who take from it everything you can swindle it out of, and return to it sneers, corruption, evil example, depraved tastes, and debased amusement? Give Mr. Potter his hat and show him out, unquote. But two years later, when cold and disinterested, Sylvia Castle asks Paul Potter about his forthcoming marriage to Clara Funk, the only child of the August Funk St. Louis beer millions. Paul, the capitalist Charlie McCarthy of his time, admits that the system of living he has chosen, has been a failure. Quote, no, Sylvia, it has not been worthwhile. My whole life is a horrible lie, a poisonous blunder, a soul destroyer. Sometimes I catch a vision of the truth, but always I turn away from it quickly, or I couldn't keep on. I know it's all rotten and false, but it's too late. Unquote. Although the book ended on this tragic note, it was a sensational success. My copy is from the seventh edition. It probably went into many more. It became one of the best sellers of the time, and it caused a great commotion. But not in literary dovecotes and lion's dens. 
The general public loved Patterson's novel, but the highbrows of the time, the socialist highbrows too, the very literary circle of which the author, in his novel, approved of, the novelists and playwrights of the new school, gave this little brother of the rich a rather haughty proletarian shoulder, and left him only the applause of those he did not care anything about. Thus began the souring off process in the socialistic career of young Patterson. I would not be surprised if this snobbery of the literary left lost the radical cause one of the most powerful publishers in America. There was, of course, the new responsibility of editing the Tribune. James Keeley was doing a great job. Everyone said that the Tribune would founder if Keeley ever carried out his threat to quit. Keeley was the pet of Joseph Medill's heirs, Mrs. Patterson and Mrs. McCormick, two old women who refused to let their sons enjoy any power. But Joe Patterson and R. R. McCormick found a clever way of seizing control. In my Tribune days, the credit was always given the attorney, McCormick, for planning the coup. But Burton Rasco gives it to Patterson. At any rate, the two discovered that under the Medill will, the Medill Trust governed the paper, and that their two mothers, who owned almost all the stock, could only vote two proxies, whereas printers and old friends of the founders also owned small blocks of stock, each having a proxy. Patterson and McCormick discovered these owners in the Middle West and in Boston. They presented their case. They got the proxies, and one year, when Keeley was making a conventional farce of the board meeting, Patterson elected himself president and McCormick chairman. Without a moment to lose, Patterson and McCormick moved into Keeley's office and took over editorship and management. They made of the Tribune a greater success than Keeley promised. The World War acquaintance with the people-haters, Bernhardi and Nietzsche, and the demands of editing and publishing soon completed the change in Patterson's viewpoints on social problems. McCormick never had any. Patterson's New York Daily News is the first tabloid newspaper in America and claims the largest circulation of any in the world. It employs 2,500 persons, has an annual payroll of six million dollars, and is housed, which is one of the great achievements of modern architecture. The paper is also one of the largest profit makers in the world. Tabloids were first successful in England. They are small and full of pictures. In America, they are usually sensational although this can no longer be said of the Daily News, parenthesis. The New York Evening Post, for a short time, experimented with the tabloid form, but remained conservative in type and tenor, and found that there was no consumer demand, end parenthesis. The elements, sex, love, money, crime, are usually predominant in mass circulation papers. The story goes that Patterson and Lord Northcliffe discussed the press and the public, the latter contending that, human nature being pretty much the same world over, the Americans should take to the tabloid press. But when Patterson countered with the suggestion that human nature being pretty much the same the world over, the British people should take to the American style of news on the front page and headlines proportionate to the event. Northcliffe did not accept this thesis, but Lord Beaverbrook did, and his Express beat Northcliffe's paper in London circulation. Patterson's News 
launched on June 26, 1919, averaged but 57,000 for its first full year. In 1920, it became established with 247,000 copies, and today it has 1,700,000 or more daily and 3 million Sundays. It has printed a weekday edition of 112 pages and a Sunday edition of 156. Ignorance, befuddlement, and unfairness are apparent in the editorials on the war in Spain. For instance, on January 11, 1938, the thought was expressed that, quote, to those who sympathize with the poor, wretched people of Spain, who will lose and pay for the civil war, no matter whether the Reds or the Fascists win, the news of the Fascist garrison's peaceable surrender at Teruel must be welcome news, unquote. Here the word Reds is used for the Loyalists, a libelous and misleading appellation which both the United Press and the Associated Press have warned against and which only Hearst and the Catholic hierarchy have repeated. There is no reason except ill will and a desire to spread propaganda, which is of course the exact opposite of the truth, which can motivate anyone who refers to the popular front in Spain as communist or red. In the Daily News editorial, moreover, there is the added confusion of lumping fascists with the democratic Spanish people, quote, who will lose and pay for the civil war, unquote, together. A fascist victory must mean the exploitation of the Spanish people to pay for the war, because it would mean the restoration of the land and mine owners, the feudal, land-owning, stock-owning church, and the exploiters of the agrarian population into power, whereas the victory for the labor unions and other elements chiefly constituting the popular front will mean that the war makers, the fascists, the rich, the landowners, mine owners, and exploiters will have to pay for the war, not the victorious people. Since the news stories have already reported the means by which the Popular Front is already enforcing such a social, revolutionary economic program, there is no excuse for this confusion. Still more unfair is the January 17, 1938 reference to Spain. After denying the view of ex-Ambassador Dodd that America should do something about preserving democracy which the dictators are destroying, the Daily News editorial says, quote, Suppose England and the United States should go in together to save Spain. There would be a harsh dispute to begin with among ourselves on whether to save Spain from the fascists or from the Reds. When Spain was saved, would the Spaniards take democracy or wouldn't they? Unquote. Again, the Hearst and purely Hearst falsehood of the conflict in Spain being between fascism and communism is accepted, whereas no honest man has ever disputed the fact that the Spanish Republic is not communist or red, but a coalition which is overwhelmingly democratic. There were about 50,000 who voted the communist ticket in the 1936 election, and the party in 1938 boasted 250,000, a quarter of a million men and women out of the 12 million population then on the loyalist side of the front. Patterson's Daily News has been no more liberal or fair toward China than toward Spain. On November 25, 1937, for example, it declared editorially, quote, looks as if China's licked, unquote. 
while, quote, we feel gloomy over the impending Chinese defeat, unquote, the editorial concluded, quote, it takes good soldiers to win a war. The Chinese haven't enough good soldiers. And the Chinese seem fated by nature to be a subject people. They always have been kicked around by the rulers, foreign or Chinese. The world is composed of natural-born masters and natural-born servants, unquote, parentheses. This is the Nietzsche slaven moral touch. End parentheses. After announcing this social political philosophy, which is at variance with the findings of the greatest thinkers of all time, the Daily News turns to the field it knows best realistic commerce. It says, quote, If Japan wins, it will probably build up a powerful mainland empire in China. With that empire, we should do business, all the business we can, regardless of our disapproval of the way the land was acquired, unquote. About a month later, the American gunboat Panay was sunk. The Daily News said editorially, quote, The Chinese are licked, unquote. But it also said two other things. It said in plain English that the Pan A was convoying three Standard Oil Company vessels, supplying oil to either Chinese planes or Chinese civilians, and it admitted that, quote, We have long backed up our business people and missionaries in China with armed force, unquote recommending that we, quote, scuttle out of China, unquote. Isolationism at any price is the editorial policy of the Daily News. But when it comes to Mexico, there is no longer a question of sincerity, goodwill, or obscurantism. It is the editorial proof that the fine socialistic fervor that once coursed in Joe Patterson's humanitary blood, is very, very quiescent. Here again, as in the Times, the Herald Tribune, the Sun, the Hearst Press, and Harry Chandler's Los Angeles Times, the old battle of human rights versus property is decided in favor of property with all the high-sounding sophistries, euphemisms, and propagandist inaccuracies which money can command. The president of Mexico is continually attacked. Quote, Cardenas asks for it, unquote, is the editorial heading on March 3, 1938, which begins with the story that Italian Bolsheviks seized the factories in 1920 and, quote, Mussolini's march on Rome put an end to that, for better or worse, unquote. I am pretty sick and tired of exploding this myth. I think that every intelligent man and woman in America knows that Mussolini did nothing of the kind and that he wrote in June 1921 that Bolshevism is dead in Italy. But because it suits an editorial purpose, a well-known truth is paraded to point a moral. The crux of the editorial follows, quote, Mexican oil development has not been brought about by American or British or Dutch imperialists walking in with big guns and black snake whips to yank guitar-playing natives out of a state of primitive purity and chain them to derricks and tank cars. The foreigners bought their way into Mexico's oil fields with the consent of previous Mexican governments. They have paid Mexico royalties on production." Unquote. Every reliable authority on Mexico has given the proof 
of the gigantic fraud by which the oil lands were stolen from the Mexican people, and the bloodshed and murder by which they have been held and exploited by American, British, and Dutch interests. Every person who knows anything about Mexico knows about this business, but somehow it never enters the editorial offices of the Jingo newspapers. When Hearst and Harry Chandler demand invasion of Mexico, the reason is apparent. Both are large land, mine, and property owners, and they fear socialization. But why should Joe Patterson publish such anti-Mexican propaganda? The largest American company operating in Mexico is the Huesteca Petroleum Company, one of the Doheny Group. In the suit of Huesteca versus the Compañía Mexicana de Combustible, it was testified that American corporations hired gunmen to murder the four Mexican owners of a well they wanted, that the last of the owners was shot but not killed, and that the corporation sent a physician who poisoned the wounded man. Quote, Probably ninety percent of the titles of the Westeca Company are usurpations, unquote. One of the documents in the case reads, Probably ninety percent of all the oil titles held by foreigners in Mexico are usurpations and illegal. But, continues the Daily News on March 31st, quote, the United States cannot afford to let Mr. Cardenas get by with his steal of Mexican oil. We use the word steal advisedly. About $500 million has been invested in Mexican oil development, and of this amount Mexicans put up only 1%, unquote. Within a day or two after this declaration, the American Secretary of State declared the Cardenas plan legal. It is not a steal. It is actually the carrying out of the 1917 Constitution, which restores the stolen mineral wealth to the nation and to the people, all the people, instead of the corporations. The spectacle of that great imperialist nation, Tory Britain, protesting Cardenas's plan for repayment while refusing to pay her own debts, failed to impress Patterson's paper. Apparently, private property, and not human life, is the utmost value in this materialistic world. I do not know how sincere Cardenas is. I have been in Mexico and praised Cayes's plan, which turned out to be nothing but another looting expedition, and I have seen other noted Mexican leaders betray their people for money, but on the face of it, at this moment, it is apparent that Cardenas is trying to do justice to the Mexican people. He is trying to do something that the author of Confessions of a Drone was hoping would be done in 1906. But in the editorial column published on May 23, 1938, by the author of the Confessions, the red flag is pinned on President Cardenas. He is accused of acting on Trotsky's advice, quote, to put over a red readjustment, unquote. And, Patterson's paper concludes, we don't see how our government can afford to side with or encourage Cardenas, as our liberals and radicals are insisting it shall. Cardenas grabbed other people's oil wells, unquote. And this is very bad for the British and our own Navy. The drone has now become metamorphosed. The little brother of the rich has become one of the lords of the British and American imperialism. Or take the Patterson editorials dealing with economics. 
On December 30th, 1937, General Motors Corporation is dealt with and defended against a daily worker proposal that instead of declaring $64 million dividends to men who have done nothing, the 30,000 workers who make GM cars and who were fired that day should be retained. On February 6, 1938, maldistribution of wealth is dealt with. I will not quote either editorial. It is true that the Daily News is aimed at the less than 14-year-old mind, but that is no reason for editorials being written by economic illiterates. On the other hand, the editorial writers of this same newspaper, once they are free to step out of the labyrinth of economics and international politics, where they are lost through ignorance or ill will, are fearless in their attack on public injustices and even the hypocrisy of fellow publishers. The News, for example, is one of the three or four papers of the country which has declared the publisher's use of the term freedom of the press a pious fraud. It is one of the few newspapers which has denounced the ANPA for its dirty work in continuing child labor and it is probably the only newspaper which has espoused and demanded the abolition of the press subsidy by the United States government. Probably the bravest thing the news has done has been its editorial defiance of the pressure of the Catholic Church. This pressure is one of the most important forces in American life, and the only one about which secrecy is generally maintained no newspaper being brave enough to discuss it, although all fear it and believe that the problem should be dragged into the open and made publicly known. In January 1938, the news realizing that the annual child labor amendment would again be defeated, blamed the Catholic bishops of the state, and especially Bishop Edmund F. Gibbons of Albany. It derided the propaganda which called the freeing of children regimentation or youth control and called the bishops misled. It continued, quote, Nearly all radicals and many liberals maintain that the Catholic hierarchy in this country tends to be more and more conservative, in some cases reactionary. In so far as this is true, the explanation would seem to lie in the fact that many of these ecclesiastics are elderly gentlemen who administer the properties of their diocese, both in real estate and in securities, a function which would tend to give some of them the cast of mind of the conservative businessman." Unquote. To criticize the Catholic Church is to invite a boycott the withdrawal of advertising, loss in circulation, and in revenue. Yeah, just ask Dr. Stan Monteith. Yeah, that's why he doesn't criticize Rome. It is the same when a newspaper prints news favorable to the labor movement. Nevertheless, it was the news which, in the spring of 1937, dedicated the page opposite its editorials, to a fair discussion of both sides of the labor problem. The economic battle page was the logical successor to the presidential battle page, which had, in 1936, given Democrats and Republicans equal space to make and answer arguments. This is one of the most honest things that has happened in American newspaper history, and in a concluding chapter, a challenge to the American press is based upon its willingness to open its columns to both sides of political and economic questions. Throughout the Roosevelt administration, the news has been one of the few papers exposing the hypocrisy of many of the campaigns against the president and his policies. Roosevelt was for taxation, but publishers, being human beings, were opposed to paying. 
Most notable Roosevelt haters are Colonel McCormick of the Chicago Tribune and the unspeakable Hearst. These men and the majority of publishers moved heaven and earth and 90% of the presses to attack the administration's taxation policy, using every argument which endangered pocketbooks and bought brains could produce. But Patterson said bluntly that almost the entire opposition to the president's taxation program arose from the selfish motives of the publishers. They are wealthy men. They feel that their money is menaced by proposed taxation, and they have therefore worked themselves up into the hysterical state of mind which confuses public welfare and their personal financial welfare. When the 1938 reorganization bill was defeated, the New York Times followed its usual custom of asking the leading newspapers of the country to give their editorial views. The general public, of course, never knows which views are accepted, which thrown into the wastebasket. But the news has not hesitated to break another journalistic taboo, which is to keep quiet about the ethics of fellow newspapers. It attacked the Times, saying, quote, We're annoyed with the New York Times, which always asks us for advance proofs of our editorials on New Deal developments, then consistently fails to print the editorial or any part thereof. The Times, however, prints the Herald Tribune editorial or part of it on the same subject. Don't misunderstand us. We admire the Times greatly and think it is one of the master newspapers of the world. But in this small and annoying particular, it is misrepresenting on occasion the reaction of the New York morning press to phases of the New Deal. Maybe the Times feels that the news is not a newspaper. That doesn't bother us. We've been contempted by experts. But after all, the news currently has three times the circulation of the Times and five times that of the Herald Tribune. If the Times pretends to collect cross-sections of press opinion on important national affairs and print them for its readers' full information, it ought to include the news opinion, or it ought not to telephone over to our newspaper shop for advance proofs." Unquote. Equally frank is Patterson regarding the publication of Dirt, which was once almost a monopoly of the Hearst Press, and which has lately been charged to the tabloid press. At the end of the notorious Browning case, which reached the nadir of filth when the McFadden Graphic published, quote, Composographs, unquote, picturing the elderly Browning and the youthful, quote, unquote, Peaches, the Daily News said editorially, quote, Far be it from us to pin a lily on our coat. The news also has gone too far. As long as there is more newspaper circulation in more smut, some presses will be found to roll out the smut. We hate bureaucracy. We hate the suppression of free speech. But unless the minds of the children of New York are to be drenched in obscenity, it seems to us that the censorship of the press, as well as of the theater, must come." Unquote. There are many sorts of fake news items in the world press. The accidental fakes, which all the vigilance in the world cannot prevent. The willful fakes, which are connected with editorial policy. And the semi-fakes, which can be argued for a lifetime. The matter of news faking is never discussed in newspapers. But Patterson, in this field, is also an iconoclast. Said the news, on April 28, 1936, quote, We're afraid it was a fake. We printed a story from a New England correspondent saying that $20,000 in Lindbergh ransom bills had recently turned up in Albany and in various Massachusetts towns. We are convinced now that the story was a fake. We are sorry to have published the story. We mention it in this 
public manner because we want to make it clear that this newspaper does not knowingly or intentionally fake news. We think any newspaper that does fake news is foolish. It is so easy to expose a fake news story, and as soon as the public finds out about it, the paper that published the fake loses some reader confidence. Repeat the process often enough, and the newspaper loses the confidence of all the readers except the natural-born and incurable suckers. We want our readers to know that the news published in this paper is always true to the best of our knowledge. Unquote. Nevertheless, on the following September Unquote. 4th, the news devoted the story on page almost three was its headed, entire front quote, page read the following seized sensation plot to blow up FDR plot quote, to kill FDR the story said nipped. that quote an alien's One, radical alien plot seized was with bombs unquote. in the New York Times that same morning there was a mere quarter column story on an inside page there was no mention of a plot to assassinate the president but on the other hand there was the statement that, quote, among articles found in the shack, it was reported, were communist literature and several copies of the Moscow press, unquote. By evening, there was no plot to kill the president, no red, no communists, no Moscow news, nothing but an old man suffering, quote, apparently from a persecution mania, unquote as the Post truthfully reported, but neither the News nor the Times apologized. This is one of thousands of episodes which illustrates the case against the American press today. It is no longer a matter of mere sensationalism, of yellow journalism, which so perturbed our fathers. It is now a matter of distortion, coloration, a recklessness, if not a sinister intention, to blame aliens, reds, communists, and in other instances, labor, liberals, and progressives, for violence, plottings, and all the ills of a disturbed epoch. In the cases of the Hursts, the McCormicks, and the rest of the reactionary majority of the ANPA, the intention is more obvious every year. In the case of Patterson, it is not bad will, but confusion. Patterson still likes to pull down his slouch hat, pull up his coat collar, play the working man, go into the streets, mingle with common people, and find out what they do and what they want. He does not go slumming like his sister Eleanor, he goes because of that old socialistic urge. Quote, he always had a social conscience. He is by nature, by action, and by conviction, democratic and equalitarian, unquote, writes Burton Rasco, who has known J.M.P. for decades. Quote, he is impulsive, erratic, and impatient, unpredictable, a man who acts and works on hunches. He is devoid of all except the most elementary reasoning powers. And his mistakes have been made through the initial errors of assuming that he was thinking when he was merely feeling, and of attempting to apply a logical process to matters of pure instinct and emotion. His most charming quality is that of trying to live up to his principles, and half the time he does not know what his real feelings are, so numerous are they, so complex and so checked and leashed by obligations to his conscience, to his employees, to the handful of heirs of the Chicago Tribune properties, to his belief in his mission in the world, and to his innate, half-repressed, half-satisfied quest for a full, free life of admirable action and true noblesse oblige. Unquote. Patterson passed through the North Cliff phase 
when he too thought he could either be a great power in politics or, failing that, the secret manipulator of the mannequins who play in the front pages of the nation's press. Patterson's slavery to the North Cliff complex has not been long or important. He has seen service for a year in the Illinois House of Representatives, but he later quit his job as Commissioner of Public Works in Chicago when he learned that he could not beat gang politicians. The North Cliff phase of direct action was knocked out by dirty politics, and the second North Cliff phase, that of being the secret manipulator, has not superseded his old democratic Marxian experiences. In 1933, he went in as an ordinary reporter to interview the head of a New York bank on which there was a run. The great banker said the bank was sound. Patterson agreed. But suddenly he was back in his old soapbox days of Chicago socialism. He turned on the banker and gave him a tongue-lashing on the evils of the capitalist system. J.M.P. treats his employees better than 90 or perhaps 99 percent of the publishers of America. He is one of the few owners respected and liked by the newspaper guild. No one has ever accused him of double-crossing, nor have briefs charging violations of the law been filed against him. Some of the self-announced great liberal newspapers cannot make equal claims. The News is one of the richest newspapers in America, and its publisher could well afford to defy all the pressures which prevent our country from having a free press. He does defy more of them than ninety-nine percent of his colleagues, but that is not enough, and it is a great pity. The matter of money is the chief obstacle to a free press, and no one has been more outspoken than Joseph Medill Patterson in exposing just that fact about his fellow publishers. And it is not a matter of money that keeps Patterson from producing not only a great newspaper, but a free newspaper. A great free newspaper demands if not a great mind, at least a social sense back of it. And Patterson has only good intentions. Otherwise, he is confused. He is just as courageous now as he was thirty years ago when he defied the social financial milieu into which he was born when he became a socialist. He has not grown reactionary as the majority of publishers editors and famous columnists do when they gain fame, money, and social standing. But somewhere between 1908 and 1916 there was a moral detour, and ever since then the Patterson psyche has been traveling nowhere amidst great confusion and spectacular headlines. Somewhere between his ivory tower and his soapbox there is still a chance that Joe Patterson will find himself. Okay, folks, this concludes chapters 1 and 2 from Lords of the Press by George Seldes from 1938. Way out of print. Why? Because it's stuff you're not supposed to know, and it's rejected knowledge.